I found online um, a story by a man called um, Nemo Flaherty. And Nemo Flaherty was a very famous Irish essayist and writer. And he wrote a story, a short story called The Stone, which is about an old man kind of lamenting his lost virility and strength and youth. And uh, But he remembers the testing stone of the village on the Aran Islands on Inish Moor. And he, when he remembers that, he goes down and he tries to pick up the stone again. In, 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 he's in his late 80s. Um, he dies in the attempt. And then the end of the story was that the old, the young men of the village, through curiosity, went to his funeral. And then they went down and began to lift the stone again. Um, because they, they, they jogged their memory about this, this testing stone. So I was like, that was an incredible story. You know, I was just kind of, I was bowled away with the story. I was like, imagine if that was true. But then I got to researching about it and I got to looking online and delving and talking to professors and talking to, um, especially some like Islanders on, on the Aran Islands. And this one woman called Fiona was like, um, the stone that Limo Flaherty wrote about is an actual stone. It's down in a place called Gortna Coppel in Port Vale on Dune, um, on the east side of Inish Moor. It's still there. And that's the story that Limo Flaherty wrote about. So it's like, it's a real, that's a real thing. I couldn't fucking believe it. So, I mean, that weekend, I hopped in a camper van with my friends and drove over to Galway, got the ferry to the Aran Islands and went down to this place called Gorton Coppel, which is a 25 minute cycle and got down to this stone. And I didn't know where it was at that point. Like, I was searching around. I'm like, if you have me to the Aran Islands, it's just fucking rocks. There's just rocks all over the place. You know, the Aran Island is made with stone. It's just stone, there's no grass. It's like, how am I going to find a fucking stone in a field of stone? But I was walking down this um, narrow pathway down towards the beach and there in a the little patch of grass by itself and he described it in the book was this pink granite stone sitting in a patch of grass rude stones all around it like it says in the story and I was like that's it that has to be it it, it, it stands out like a sore thumb it's pink in a field of grey Hello and welcome to the Spirit Box Podcast, where we explore folklore, magic, the world of the spirits and everything in between. Today it is our great pleasure to welcome Indiana Stones himself, the one and only David Keown. Hailing from Ireland, David is a stone lifter, a kettlebell world champion, an artist and a musician, and he's been on a mission to rediscover Ireland's lost stone lifting culture, and has done so through his research through Irish literature and folklore. We spoke all about his stone lifting journey from his lifting of the Fianna Stone in Scotland, which inspired his own search in Ireland, culminating in the rediscovery of the stone described by the very famous Galway writer Liam O'Flaherty in his short story, The Stone. In the space of 18 months, David has rediscovered 30 testing stones, a remarkable act of reclamation and celebration of this lost tradition. Through this act, David has created a, a genuine and unique magical act of healing of the multi-generational trauma of Ireland's colonisation. These great testing stones, now rediscovered, form a chain back into our ancient past, before our colonisation, before Christianity, and in lifting these stones once more, the chain is renewed, and in a feat of strength, a deep ancestral healing is taking place. David's work is a brilliant and inspiring intersection of folklore, magic, mythology and strength and is one that I found on a personal level deeply, deeply moving and, uh, and I hope you do too. Now in the Plus Show we get into ancestral work and share our experiences in that area. We discuss the ideas of concepts of animism around stone lifting. We get into big Irish cultural figures like Peg Sayers and discuss how sometimes spirits and ghosts can be leading us to tell their stories. And we close out the show with David telling us about his next his next trip that he has planned, which is a visit to the Death Stone of Cúcullin. And again, this blew my mind. I didn't really I didn't even know that actually this existed. So uh, a, a, a truly special moment there as well. And I close out the show with uh, a reading of Limo Flaherty's story, The Stone, which I think is a nice little cherry on top for this podcast to close it out and give you a sense of the, the meaning of that stone to the people of Aaron, to people of Inishmore. Now, if you'd like to hear the Plus Show, there are 
well, I was going to say the many ways to do so. There's one way to do so. Join the Patreon. That's really it. And uh, But if you do, you get access to a lot more content. I go through uh, a lot of uh, accounts of experiences that people send through to me, um, which are always fascinating. And there might be something that resonates to you, something that might mean something to you and some experiences that you may have had, that you may have experienced. I find we learn from the insights of others when they recount and share their experiences. Right, that's uh, that's enough for me. Let's get on with the show. Right, so uh, David uh, Keown, you're very, very welcome to the Spirit Box. Lovely to have you on the show. Dara, thank you so much for having me on, man. Um, we're looking forward to it now. Nah, uh, it's it's a real pleasure to have you have you on the show. Um, as I was just saying before we hit record, there I've been following your stuff um, for a while uh, with a mix of um, of awe uh, at these <laughs> massive stones and uh, and just real um, real respect for what you're doing in in rediscovering this this. Um, uh, I mean, it's I know it's a tradition across many places in the world, but uh, really not known in Ireland, and you're you're bringing it back to to. Uh, to the forefront and bringing it back to to Irish culture, I think it's amazing. And um, rather than me wit her on about that, <laughs> um, would you tell the listeners a bit about yourself and and why I'm talking about stones? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like what, 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 what's it going on about? But look, yeah. Um, my name is David Keown, and I've spent the last, I suppose, two years, maybe two and a half years now, researching and looking for the ancient tradition of stone lifting in Ireland which had its roots in, um, you know, feats of strength by, by men and women of the villages. They were uh, rites of passage for men and women in these villages. And they, they were great like social status, and you got greater like, social clout by being able to lift these, these testing stones of the area, you know. Um, they were feats of strength. They, were, they had all kinds of tales and mythologies attached to them. I mean, there's, there's so much involved in all of this. It's been an incredible journey over the past two years, Dara, you know, and it was something that was absolutely lost. It was almost gone. Like I'm just blowing on the embers of an almost dead thing. But what has been just so rewarding over the past, especially the last six months, has been that it's almost garnered this whole cultural identity now. You know, people are starting to latch on to this and kind of like, oh, this is fucking great. You know, people are kind of saying, look, this is part of our culture. This is part of our folklore. And this is part of our history that was lost. It was gone um, through many, many different factors, I suppose. But And they're really enjoying, the, like the Irish public is really enjoying the, the re-emergence re and the resurgence of this. And, and I can, I'm loving it myself. It's been an incredible journey, you know? I, I, I Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what my interest is, 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 uh, is observing this, this, you know, uh, old part of our culture just... Um, been reignited you know mm. i mean you were you were literally have taken those embers and 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 given the flame again it's, it's a wonderful wonderful thing um and um what was i going to say is there were I, I i slightly disappointed with one thing is that there's more stones in galway than there are in mayo <laughs> <laughs> like you know I'm, I'm, galway I'm, seems I'm, to be the hotbed for yeah, it always, my, my heart's in mayo and i'm like you know <laughs> There's well, I, I will give you this. Like, I think one of the best stories in out of all of them is yeah. the uh, the clock on Dara, the the giant's throwing stone in Mayo, yeah. which is just an unbelievable story. You know, it's it's fantastic. It's got everything. It's like mm. it's like mythology and reality combining. You know, and the bridge is is that stone in in Mayo. Like that was a giant's throwing stone. So like this, the, the tale goes that um, one of the giants up in the area a couple of thousand years ago, and I think it might be Donald Dual Builder who was. Um, a local giant of the area, one of the only two eyed giants, actually most of them had one eye, but uh, he used to throw that stone around like a pebble and said the mark of his hands is in the top of the stone. You know, so I'm finding about all of these giant throwing stones, and Dara, they're everywhere. You go to any village in Ireland, there's a giant throwing stone there. Any glacial or attic has been yeah. thrown by Fiona Cool or one of the Fina from a mountaintop, you know? Yeah. And, but I always wanted to, like, I, would, I was thinking to myself, I'd love to find a giant throwing stone. There was also a, a testing stone or a lifting stone, you know. Yeah. But all these other ones I went to were they, were, they were called giant throwing stones for a reason. They're massive, you know, yeah. absolutely huge. Like anything up to four or 500 ton, all the way down to maybe like 800 kilos to like a, one ton. I was like, sure. <laughs> Obviously, no normal man can pick that up. 
Well, yeah. all the tales were that there were the marks of their hands were in these stones, you know? So their fingerprints are like their thumb prints were in these stones. And all of the ones I visited, it looked like that. You know, it looked like there was big hand marks in the side yeah. of these stones. Like, that's really, really cool. But then I found that one at Ducas in the National Folklore Collection about the giant's throwing stone they used to throw around like a pebble um, over his shoulder with one hand. But said the marks of his hands is in the top of the stone where he squeezed it like soft clay. Yeah. So I went up and I found that stone sitting in the middle of a village green up in um, uh, Ahagaur, up in County Mayo, just about 15 minutes from Westport. Right. I was like, there's the, <laughs> there's the bridge between mythology and reality. You know what I mean? There it is. And you can go and pick it up. You know, it's it's just incredible. That, I mean, that's amazing. I, I've been watching your 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 um, your um shorts on YouTube and it, it, it showed the, the stone at Ahagaur. Uh, it's you're saying it's about 15 minutes away from Westport, is it? It's only about 15 minutes away from Westport, yeah. Yeah. Tiny little village. I mean, you drive down this this tiny road just to live with the one car. Yeah. And you're like, I'm going to the middle of nowhere here, you know? Mm. There's nothing around you. It's just bog land. Yeah. And then you're driving about maybe 15 minutes down the single lane road, and then this village just, appear, just appears. You come around a bend, yeah. and you drive into It's like driving into three or 400 years ago, into like right. what you think the most quintessential Irish village you can possibly think of. Right. Round Tower. Ruined cathedrals, catch pubs, stone bridges, rivers. I mean, this place is fucking magic. And there is the Lipton Stone and just sitting in the middle of the screen, just sitting there waiting for people, you know? And it's not even a plaque there. I couldn't get over it when I got there. That was like, you should be celebrating this thing. The story behind this is absolutely incredible. That's amazing. So just getting onto the local councils now and asking these guys just to kind of get, get started, you know? That's fantastic. Um, I'm, I'm curious, what I was going to say now is... Um, the weight of these things, like I was watching, Jesus, some of the fucking stones you've been lifting, man. Like seriously, <laughs> I know. A fucking not to tell me. I mean, it's it's incredible. I mean, like what I found with the Irish lifting stones there as well is like there seem to be the heaviest on mass in, in the whole world. You know, what I mean, wow, that that I've come across anyway. And I, I've, I've researched this quite a lot, and I've lifted, gone to many different countries and lifted them. And friends of mine have gone to nearly all the different countries who have lifting stones. Yeah, and the Irish lifting stones seem to be the heaviest. So, like you're talking. Average, probably about average 170 kilos, which is Jesus Christ. phenomenal. I mean, it's huge. You know, There's I mean? a lot of Americans who listen to that. What does that, what's what's 170 kilos in America? Probably about 370, 375 pounds. Fuck me. You know, so I mean, that's a big weight. You know, I mean, yeah. it's a big weight. For, like even on a deadlift, it's a, it's a decent enough deadlift, you know. Yeah. But a deadlift is made to be lifted like a stone isn't. So it, it, it's yeah. a, by definition a lot harder to pick up something like that, you know. So it's been a lot of training involved there over the past yeah. couple of years to try and see can pick these things up as well. I can imagine. I can imagine. And, and as you mentioned beforehand, like at the, at the top of the show, that there were a number of factors why um, this tradition has been forgotten. Mm. You know, and I mean, be, before we start kicking the English, like... Um, <laughs> Which we will. As, like, as reason number one, <laughs> one to <laughs> ten. <laughs> uh, but... Um, like there's the whole factor of like pre-famine how the, uh, the Irish yeah. person was physically bigger pre-famine and the actual impact of the famine um, yeah. meant Irish people were, were I mean like I think this is like a foot off the height for mm-hmm. the next generation after the famine that it had such an impact that, that pre-famine these dudes were were were, were big men Exactly. Know? I mean, and that, that had a huge bearing on it you know, I mean I've been talking about this with quite a few people lately and quite a few professors and uh, historians, and it's like, yeah, I mean, the cutoff point seemed to be like 1840, you know, because this was a thriving tradition in all of these villages, yeah. all around Ireland, everywhere, you know. And then uh, the famine came, 1840s, and A, obviously a lot of people died, you know, half the, half the population died or emigrated. Yeah. So, like, you had the stories and the legends and the tales of these lifting stones went with them, you know, so whether they yeah. died with them, or where they they moved to cities, you know. Then you had urbanization, and then you had the like of, of people moving to immigrating to different countries as well. So like a lot of this, a lot of this just just died off. Yeah. And I mean, you know, you can barely lift yourself up off the ground if you're starving. You know, you're not, the last thing you want to do is pick up something heavy, like, yeah. like a lifting stone or testing stone, and they just got forgotten about. You know. And of course, then I mean, like that that had a huge bearing on it. But then in the last hundred years, like with with modernization, um, with the tarring of roads, which like a lot of these stones were at crossroads there. Right. I know a lot of them were meeting points and crossroads. Um, 
and they were they were just packed earth with, with with horses and carts. And then like the tarring of the roads, so they were either broken up by stone breakers and put into the road, yeah. or they were just chucked over hedges and forgotten. So yeah. a lot of them are gone. I mean, this was a, a, a nationwide um culture, yeah. but there's only a few remnants of it left, and mainly in the West. Right. But which would probably be, I guess, historically the most underdeveloped um provincial area anyway, you know. I think exactly. I think I think that's one of the main reasons. Um because of that, the landscape, you know, it's it's so stony and rocky that yeah. these stones are just one among thousands. So like they, they didn't stand out. Mm-hmm. Um, and like you said, the ground, just the ground was so poor, you know. And I think the fact that like a lot of them were in Gwail Talked areas as well, Dara, which which yeah. they kept these old stories. I mean, I've been to a lot of these Gwail Talked areas over the past yeah. couple of years. Yeah. And I've met the men, like maybe the last man who lifted this stone, you know, which could be 50 years ago or the great the great grandson of the man last man who lifted the stone and yeah. he remembers it and he's kept that stone there you know and he's he's looked after it he looked after the area he's made yeah. sure it never got moved and if it did get moved by something like a storm if it's down by a beach side yeah. he put it back because it was part of his family history you know so that's beautiful you know that you get to go up and meet these people that's lovely and yeah. it's a veneration for these things because like I said it's part of their their local lore their local culture and um as we mentioned, you you spent a lot. You found a lot of stones out in Galway, and um, mm. there there's some fantastic uh, photographs here on on Instagram out in Aaron. Um, yeah, yeah. You, is it the three islands you found the stones on, or, or yeah, there's yeah. there's one there's a testing stone on each of the islands. No, yeah. um, I got the last of the set there about about three months ago, and um, the last one I found was on Inishir, which is the smallest of the Aran Islands. Yeah. So, like the Aran Islands archipelago, does if anyone who doesn't know, there's three islands. Um, the Aran Islands, the Inish Moor, which is the big one, Inish Man, which is the middle one, and Inish Year, which is the small one. And um, I suppose the most famous uh, lifting stone, I think, in Ireland, I think that's one that's really like the jewel in the crown, is the one on, on Inish Moor, which is the Limo Flaherty stone, yeah. which just has an absolutely incredible story attached to it. And could you tell us that story? Sure, sure. I mean, um, this is the very first lifting stone that I found. Because like, I, went to, I went to Scotland and I lifted, like, they have a huge culture of stone lifting over there. So I went over to Scotland and I lifted many, many of their lifting stones over a weekend. And But the one of the most incredible ones I found over there was a stone called the Fina stone, which is in relation to the Fina warriors. So it was a testing stone of the Fina warriors that if you wanted to become a part of this warrior uh, warrior band in Ireland or Scotland, one of, the, one of the tests was to lift this large stone in Glenline in Scotland. Um, so obviously this is for the, the, the Scottish branch. But I just found it amazing that you could pick up something that was maybe touched by a member of the FINA 2,000 years ago. And that stone is still there in the Glen Line in Scotland. You could pick it up and you were like, you know, a FINA warrior fucking picked this thing up 2,000 years ago. You know, now I'm doing it. It's, it's That's just wonderful. When you think of it the lineage, it's, it actually blows your mind. I so never like, thought about it that way because I've heard you talk about this before. But the way you phrase it there is so genuinely moving. Like It's incredible. I mean, you're thinking. It's really amazing. A man put, or a woman, put their hands on this stone, you know, maybe before Christ was born. You know what I mean? And they were doing that as a feat of strength. And it's been carried on all the way through. And people are now doing it again, you know? So it's it's just amazing when you think back, like that, how many people have laid hands on this? How many people have picked it up? How many people have tried to pick it up and failed, you know, and, and failed the test? So it's just, it's amazing. So that blew my mind. It was like, right, there's a Fina stone. Like, you know, Fina, Ireland, Fiona Cool, there has to be something in Ireland. So I got to search and then there, I got to look and, and I found online um, a story by a man called um, Limo Flaherty. Limo Flaherty, a very famous Irish essayist and writer. And he wrote a story, a short story called The Stone, which is about an old man kind of lamenting his lost virility and strength and youth. And uh, But he remembers the testing stone of the village on the Aran Islands on Inish Moor. And when he remembers that, he goes down and he tries to pick up the stone again. In, in, in he's in his late eighties. Um, he dies in the attempt, and then the end of the story was that the old, the young men of the village, through curiosity, went to his funeral, and then they went down and began to lift the stone again, um, because they, they they jogged their memory about this this testing stone. So I was like, that was an incredible story, you know. I was just kind of I was bowled away by the story, and I was like, imagine if that was true. But then I got to researching about it and I got to looking online and delving and talking to professors and talking to um, especially some like Islanders on, on the Aran Islands. And this one woman called Fiona was like, um, the stone that Limo Flaherty wrote about is an actual stone. It's down in a place called Gorton Acopel in Port Vale on Dune. Um, 
on the east side of Inish Moor. It's still there. And that's the story that Liam O'Flaherty wrote about. So it's like, it's a real, that's a real thing. I couldn't fucking believe it. So I mean, that weekend, I hopped in a camper van with my friends and drove over to Galway, got the ferry to the Aran Islands and went down to this place called Gorton Coppel, which is a 25 minute cycle and got down to this stone. And I didn't know where it was at that point. Like I was searching around. And like, if you have me to the Aran Islands, it's just fucking rocks. There's just rocks all over the place. You know, the Aran Island is made with stone. It's just stone. There's no grass. It's like, how am I going to find a fucking stone in a field of stone? But I was walking down this um, narrow pathway down towards the beach and there in a little patch of grass by itself, and he described, he described it in the book, was this pink granite stone sitting in a patch of grass. Rue stones all around it, like it says in the story. And I was like, that's it. That has to be it. It, it, it stands out like a sore thumb. It's pink in a field of grey. So and then I met one of the islanders um, who was giving a walking tour. And he said, yeah, that's the stone that, that's the, called the Mullon, the Mullon Port Vale on Doon. Mullon being a large granite boulder. And that was, he said, yeah, that's the testing stone in the village. He said, there it is down there. And I was like, yeah. So like the story wasn't fiction. It was based on a reality. And it wasn't just based on reality. It was based on that stone. So I mean, I went back over there to the Aran Islands um, two weekends ago. And I lifted that stone at the Limo Flaherty Festival. I was invited over by Limo Flaherty's family and the festival. And we went over in front of about four different film crews and and picked that stone up because I couldn't pick it up the first time I went there, Dara. I couldn't budge it. It's 171 kilos. It's massive. But I went over there. I want to talk about a full circle moment. I went over two weekends ago and my dad came over and my, my wife came over and all these film crews are there. And there must have been, I'm not joking, there must have been 60 people standing around me in a big, just a big circle of people and everyone cheering, you know. And they read the story of the stone down by the stone itself, which was very moving. You know, I was trying to hold back the tears because it was just, I can't believe I'm here. The last time I came here, it was just me trying to look for the stone. And now I'm back. By, I invited with the Limo Flaherty Society to lift it, you know. So then I picked that thing up off the ground and the cheer was just incredible. And um, it was just one of those moments in your life, you're like, I'm never going to forget this, you know. Because there was a there was a line in the story said that like the cheer that resounded when the man lifted that stone, he said he could still remember to this day when he was an old man. And I was like, I done the exact same thing. Like I was, I became the story in that moment. You know, I lifted it and the cheers and the people that I'll, I'll never forget that as long as I live either. And then just to fucking put the cherry on the fucking top, who did I meet down at it? Purely true coincidence was the Fiona that I um from that that little piece of text I read online. Because I was talking about this beforehand. She was like, she came up to me after this song. She said, I'm Fiona, she said. She was like, you're, they said, you're the reason I came to find this. Your text you wrote in a, in a Reddit thread 10 years ago sent me on, on this journey. And there you are now, you know. So like, it was just, it was one of those incredible moments that I'll never forget. It was just this beautiful full circle thing, you know. And I think it's the jewel in the crown of Irish Lipton Stones. It's just beautiful. The area itself is incredible. I mean, you're, you're, you're there in this field of stone, but it's a beautiful pink stone. Dune Angus is in the background. The sea is in the background. You get the smell of the salt. You know, it's just, it's absolutely mind-blowing place. You know, I'd recommend anybody to go over and see it. Uh, that's that's astonishing. Thank thank you for sharing that, you know. And and, and for um, uh, listeners who, who aren't familiar with um, the, the Iron Islands and, and Inish Moor, um, if you've seen uh, the Banshees of Inish Aaron, that's one of yeah. the islands. So the ones yeah. that all, all the flat limestone. That's that's um one of the uh, one of the islands. Exactly. Um, what a dramatic dramatic scene with Dunengus in the back as well. I mean, that's amazing. It's it's unbelievable place. I mean, like like it's magical, and I I, I mean that you know, there's a tangible magical presence mm-hmm. there, you know, because again, you're thinking back. This was the testing stone of the village. And it said in the story, from time immemorial, the men of the village lifted the stone. So time immemorial. And then you're looking up at Dunangus, which is, what, yeah. four and a half thousand years old. And you're like, yeah. how yeah. far back does this go? Is it attached to Dunangus? You, you just don't know. So, I mean, like, it's it's just, it's otherworldly being there, you know, and I mean that. I I, I totally get that. I absolutely do. And, you know, and, and they're, they're just listening to you describe, like, that connection of, like, first the stone in Scotland, that that's named after the Fianna, mm. um, is is remarkable that being you know the the Fenian cycles one of our two big mytho- mythological cycles every exactly. school child in Ireland was reared on Fionn McCool exactly uh, and the, you know the, the stories of, of, of Oisin and Tirna and all that kind of stuff you know um, and it is absolutely central to to 
our identity uh, uh, as a people and seeing and just hearing what you, you you've done in that lifting of the stone surrounded by islanders surrounded by people commemorating um the, the story uh, and Liam O'Flaherty it, it from a magical perspective that is almost like one of the most perfect stories of ancestral and cultural healing I've ever heard that's you know, incredible you know you're you're you you're bringing back something that was beaten into submission yeah, you know? exactly yeah um, yeah I mean it's I was sitting there and that there was this this young lad there in a, in a lovely white arm jumper you know and he was there reading the story um like it's only a short story it's only about 20 pages long you know and I was sitting down there looking at the stone getting ready to lift it you know and he was reading a story and I was I was holding back the tears you know I was ho- I was I was holding them back I was like I can't, I can't let out this emotion release now. I, you know, before I lift this stone, I won't be able to lift it. But it was just, like you said, it was this, and as people have said that to me before, it's, it's like a cultural healing. You're healing cultural wounds doing this. And it, it never occurred to me up until a couple of weeks ago that that's what you could be doing. You know, I didn't realize it was this important to people. And I, I never, it never hit me as that until that moment. And I was like, well, yeah, th- this is really, really important. You know, it's, and it's, it's it's such a wonderful a wonderful and honourable thing to do you know and I'm just so happy to be able to be to be a part of it you know it's it's just it's an honour. Well, you know, I thank you for 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 doing it. You know, like uh, just seeing seeing your your work online and rediscovering that that part of our lost heritage and history is just it's it's a wonderful wonderful thing and it's you know I genuinely genuinely commend you for it i think it's fantastic it's it's a fantastic thing like this is the thing is that there's we've lost so much like so much you know Mm -hmm. from from what happened you know uh our history is is essentially a nightmare really like exactly like we were colonized you know we had so much taken away we had everything Mm -hmm. taken away we were the only nation in europe that doesn't have its own language anymore you know yeah even our language was taken away and it's only surviving in small pockets around Mm-hmm. around the country now you know yeah but like i said it means so much taken away so so much taken away from us that to be able to bring something back is mm-hmm. just amazing you know and that's why i think it, people it has grabbed people so much Dara, over the past yeah couple of couple of years as an innocent journey started off with me but now like i said it, it's just grabbed people's imagination it's like yeah you're bringing back something that was gone now that was that's uniquely irish you know yeah. yeah so i'm just getting so much positivity it's wonderful you know because i mean that's just work a normal job in the shop you know, yeah. so you know, you, you feel like this whole Clark Kent kind of Superman thing going on at the moment. You know, you go back to work on a Monday and no one knows anything about this, they have no interest in it. I don't talk to anybody about it and work, yeah. you know. And they've no clue about what you're doing the weekends, but people who know know, you know, and it's yeah. it's wonderful to be getting the yeah. support from people. So and again from yourself as well. Thank you so much. Ah, not at all, you know, like um like it it, it truly is important stuff and it is like c- connecting with our past in that way, you know, and I, and I mm. think it's for kind of any culture in the world who who have experienced like like a, a depth and a le- a level of like traumatic devastation, mm. you know, like uh, like bear in mind, we're as you pointed out already, like half the country was gone in the mm. space of four years, eight million to four million in in the space of you know between what was it. Between forty five and 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 forty eight, um, yeah. you know, um, that's a level of, of like trauma that is almost unfathomable. You know, it, it really is, um, and it, you know, I think that's part of why, like, we you know, we lost our Irish, like we all we yeah. lost the language because it, it was associated with so much loss. You know, uh, yeah. And, yeah. And it's it's only recently, but like this year that um, I, at the start of the year, and I, I think it's it's probably in the same vein that where I why I was so moved from what you're doing. I mean, also there's a meathead part of me that it's just like fucking lift that stone, man. Lift that stone, man. <laughs> I don't get too emotional, but there is a part of me that's just like fuck yeah, <laughs> pull that fucking rock up, man. <laughs> It is uh, a really cool movement as well, in fairness. You yeah, can't yeah, deny it. It, it yeah. is such a cool thing to see. It, it's badass. It's proper badass. <laughs> uh, like, um, 
but but the, the part of me was like at the start of the year it was just for some reason the fact that I couldn't speak I, I've been doing a lot of re- I've been like like yourself actually I've been doing a huge amount of research into Dukas uh that I yeah. um looking for stories in relation to kind of the folkloric interpretation of the devil right in, yes in, in in uh with the school's collection and 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 so on and um and it's an absolute wealth of stuff oh it's incredible it's amazing it's incredible i love it really, really amazing and um just struggling to translate stuff from irish into english uh and and part of me felt this and oh, this shame like uh, and exactly I, was, I can't speak my own language exactly and i mean i i totally agree with that because a lot of these are found up in the Gaeltox, you know. So I'm going up to um up to Spittle and up to Carn, up to Livermore in, in, in West Galway. And I feel like a fucking tourist in my own country. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm I'm ashamed. I'm going up feeling shame, you know, because I can't speak my native tongue. Mm. You know, and it's I never felt that before because I don't have that down in Waterford, because you know, there's only one small pocket of place that that they speak Irish water in, in, in ring and water. But I mean, in my day-to-day life, I don't I don't come across the Irish language. Mm-hmm. But it's only when I traveled west. And I, I met all these wonderful people with all these wonderful, wonderful stories. And I just can't thank them enough for sharing them with me over these past few years. But I felt ashamed, you know, and I shouldn't feel ashamed. You know, mm. it's not my fault. It's not your fucking fault. Yeah. It was taken from us. It was taken from us, you know. But there's still that in you. It's still in your in your core. You feel yeah. shame that you can't converse. And like I can, I can listen, and I can hear, and I can take it in. Mm-hmm. I can hear everybody talking, and like then they're turning around and trying to, you know, speak it in English to me. And like you don't have to. Like, I can understand what you're saying, you know. But yeah. I just can't converse in it. Yeah, I, you know, yeah. So like, you know what I mean? And I know exactly what you mean. You know, and and it's but it's the differences in what the words mean. You mm-hmm. know, like, and that's the bit that I found is extremely important. Like there's nuances in the phrases and the nuances yeah. in the words. And like, you know, I, I actually schooled in the Gale Talk for a while. Right? right. I had no fucking clue what was going on. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. Like it probably explains why I can't fucking add it. Like, but, you know, doing <laughs> a shite of maths and then doing a tri-rich wasn't, wasn't <laughs> the best. No, 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 no. no. But, but um, like, like things like, like the word for wolf in, in, in Irish is mocktear, you know, mm. it's like son of the land. You know, like the like the the word for like butterfly, phalacon. Mm-hmm. It, it literally means like little flying thing. You mm-hmm. know, and like um, I can't remember exactly what the phrase is in Irish. Like uh, it's kind of a, uh, you know, like see a jellyfish, like as a it, like Ron Spieglock or something like that, right? But it translates to seal snot. Mm. Like, but that's what that's to describe a jellyfish. So it's it's like yeah. there's so much nuances that you miss if you can't understand the words. And and this is where you know when when you're listing off these stones and you're talking about like clock na this clock na mm. that. You know, it's it's specific to the area, and and that whole point of like that. You know, this was the giant's pebble. You mm. know, it has a whole mythos around it that a community would have latched around. Uh, it's it's. It's yeah, I think it's a way of like I said exactly that. It's a way of seeing the land through a uniquely Irish lens. Yeah, you know that isn't there, not as much anymore. You know yeah. you're seeing it through a uniquely Irish Gaelic lens yeah, you when know. you're speaking about these stones and you're 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 getting to these places. You know, and that's I think is 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 one of the most beautiful things. Yeah. You're not seeing it through a fucking colonized lens. You're yeah. seeing it through and the original Irish way of seeing them. You know, so that that's just beautiful. It really is, you know, and and um, you know, like Brian Friel wrote a play called Translations, um, and I don't know if you, did you do Philadelphia. Here I come for the leaving. I don't, I don't remember. I don't no, think so. No, no. no. We did like kind of Brian Friel, a couple of Brian Friel plays for the for the leaving session. Like um, Philadelphia, Here I Come was was a great one. But he had another play, but he did dancing at Lunasa and all that great. Yes, stuff, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, but but he, he had one play called Translations, and it's about these um British cartographers, uh, and I think it's supposed to be it might be the late eighteen hundreds. Mm. I think that's the time period. But they're going around the country. And they're anglicized. They're doing a map, and they're anglicizing the town names, right? And and basically, he's Brian Field is describing that severance between the people and the land, because yeah. the next generation that comes, you know, they don't, they like they they 
they don't understand the actual name of the place in relationship to the land you yeah. know um because you get like places like like in like in mayo you got places like like um like foxford like the name mm-hmm. in irish has does not it doesn't exist like it's not the same thing it's just a made up name yeah you know? so there's there's lots of that that we've lost in those translations and equally like the subtlety of phrases is the subtlety of place and that is mm-hmm. a dislocation from history from ancestry from your relationship with the land you know uh, and our historical relationship with the land yeah. which, is, which is just super important in rooting us of um, course especially in this kind of we kind of postmodernist world that we're living in now yeah you know where everything is yeah. kind of becoming a bit more homogenous anyway yeah and well like i said we've lost so much through all the troubles and now we're losing more through you know social media and through like said homogenization yeah so i mean it's it's wonderful that's why i think this is kind of hitting at the right time for for a lot of people because like i said it's so root and branch yeah. it's so part of who we are it's deeply rooted in our culture you know so it's it's just hitting at the right time in a lot of different ways yeah. and like the amount of publicity it's gotten in the last three months has been ridiculous you know but not not i don't mean that ridiculous i mean it's just it's been mind-bendingly incredible for me you know yeah i i think you've captured the the kind of the hearts and the imagination of, of of a lot of people in doing what you're doing, you know, um, and there, you know, uh, and I, I hark back again to the Fianna Stone, you know, it's mm. it's like the feat of strength, you know, um, by by these ancient warriors, you know, and then like for for those in 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 who are not familiar with the the Fianna listening, like it it's it is like the the Knights of the Round Table for Ireland, you know, be that exactly. Kind of, also, it's like the Irish Samurai. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, and, and there, you know, to become a member of the Fianna was to be, you know, to be a poet, to mm-hmm. to 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 be a, an an athlete and to be a warrior. Like there's like it, it, exactly, you had a code yeah. of conduct. You had, you had yeah. all that. I mean, they were they were welcome at any fire. They were welcome at any table. Mm. They were given a huge amount of respect. Mm-hmm. You know. And I love that um, that the three of the the, uh, the feats that you had to do um, to become part of the Fina. When the, when I was talking to the guys over in Scotland about this, some some old folklore, and like you had to walk, you had to jump the length of your kilt, which was eight feet, and um, broad jump, so a standing broad jump, um, eight feet, and um, you had to lift the Fina stone to to plinth, and then you had to run at full speed under a outheld uh, sword at chest height without breaking straight and going underneath it. So I done those three, three things in in Glen Lyon in a field. So I can actually say um, probably the only Irish man at the moment who's an actual Fina warrior. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm pretty damn proud of that. I don't That's say. brilliant. That's fantastic. <laughs> <brilliant. laughs> I, I, I must mention to you now, I, I, I meant to kind of um, I drop you a, a message on this. My... Um, my great grandfather wrote a book called The Islands of Ireland. Okay. Uh, um, and there might be something in there. Um, oh, there I mean, it's yeah. amazing, Dar, because that's where I'm finding a lot of these. Yeah. You know, all all the islands I've been to, and I've been to all the Iron Islands in the last year, so just three Iron Islands. I've been then up off of Mayo, I've been off to Inish Boffin. Yeah. Um, I've been to Inish Turk. And there's a few more smaller islands that I'm trying to get there that I know there are stones on those as well. So, I mean, is it on seemed Cahar to be. Island? A, what's that? Sorry to, to interrupt you there. Um, is written on Cahar Island. You've just you just just mentioned Cahar. Do what there is. There's there's, yeah. there's definitely on Cahar Island. I know it's there. There's a cursed um, stone there for sure. Like there's a cursed stone there, and there's a lifting stone on Cahar. Um, there's a lifting stone. I think it's on on Clare. But there's definitely a lifting stone on Cahar Island. It's just right. it's really hard to get onto Cahar Island. Yeah, I've tried is. to get onto it three times because there's no natural wharf there. Yeah. So I mean, you literally have to rock up in a boat as close as you can to the island and kind yeah. of jump off and swim. You know? I had some. I had some terrible, deluded idea that I was going to kayak out to it to photograph. <laughs> it's a fair fucking kayak. You I, want to be in the hole your head, man? For fuck's sake! I had, I had brilliantly right. I did. <laughs> this is fucking pathetic, right? But like, uh, basically, I was like, eight kilometers, not that bad. I, you know, I used to do pretty well kayaking when I was a kid. I reckon I can, I can do this. I haven't done it in fuck twenty years. Or yeah. and, uh, I did like I. Jo- I went to the local kayaking kayaking club here. Um, where I am in the south of England, kayaked about a kilometer <laughs> <You're doing laughs> right? <it. laughs> down the coast, right? Oh, like absolutely fucked. <laughs> Turns out it's not like getting on a bike. Oh, it's not fuck like that at all. No. You do forget it. <laughs> oh my god, that's a tough, that's a tough ask. Yeah, but uh, like I was talking to one of the local folklore up there, a guy called Sean O'Kushtal, who's an right. absolute, just an absolute legend of a man. You know, 
he knows, I think he pretty much knows everybody in, in the West of Ireland. But um, he was telling me that like Cahar Island was, seems to be the mecca for the ancient like uh, monastic people. It was it was the, the place to go. So there's, there is a lifting stone on um, Cahar Island. It's a round globe. Um, and it was to be lifted to shoulder, you know, and I, I don't know what's, why it's there. Um, was it used by the monks? I, I, I'm not sure, you know, but it's certainly there. I know there's, there's people, the last person lifted was about 35 years ago, um, and they, they knew a little bit more about it. But he was saying to me that there's actually tunnels underneath Cahar that come back to the mainland. No and I was like, me. I was like, are you kidding me? No, he said, there's, there's meant to be a tunnel, he said, that goes from Cahar Island to the mainland. Um almost like as, as an escape channel because it was such an important place in, in ancient in ancient times. So like I'm, like I'm I'm meeting all these local folklorists and guys with just these incredible stories. I mean, I'm, I'm writing a book on it at the moment because oh I'm like, God. you couldn't fucking make up half of this stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like even the stones themselves and the stories behind them and the mythologies and the local folklore and the history and meeting these, these fascinating characters of the West of Ireland. It's just, it's been some, it's been just, magic you know it's the only word i can amazing. describe it as that's amazing you know so it's i, I can't wait to get the, to get the book out and share it with people because it's just yeah. like you said half it you, you wouldn't believe it unless you read it <laughs> that's amazing you know i and there's a phrase that you use um and you mentioned it about the the the, the giant stone in in mayo about it being a bridge between kind of the present and our mytholo- mythological past oh definitely uh, you know um and I thought that was wonderful. I really did, you know. Um, and I thought it, it 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 also really encapsulated like the way you've been using like a folklore and 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 kind of storytelling to to find these, you know. Um, which is I I often think of it like like our folklore as being kind of like it's like our dream history, you know. Mm. Like um and it captures that kind of level of emotion, that level of almost kind of like where things lean into the supernatural a bit, you know? Um, and, and certainly I think like a, a feat of that kind of strength, the fact that these stones refer to as like the giant's throwing pebble or the Fianna really is saying that like being able to lift this is a feat of like superhuman strength, you know, like uh, it's, it's. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, like, uh... The Dukas archives are are just amazing. You know, they're they're absolutely incredible. Like I said, it's the folklore, it's the roots of the nation. You know, it's this lifeboat to who we were back before all this shit happened back in you know in the late eighteen hundreds. It's just these stories, like they're legends of our nation. They're legends of our nation. They were they were important enough that they were told to these kids back in the nineteen thirties by their parents and grandparents. So these people who lifted these stones. Like you said, they were almost, they were like local heroes or like local legends for being able to do it, you know. So to f- follow the stories, to get to the, you know, they'll usually tell you where the townland is. So you, then you go to the townland and you ask around and somebody might know somebody. So you go down to their house and they're like, oh, yeah, I think it's up here. And then you get to the place and the stone is there, you know. It's like you 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 feel like I put myself down as Indiana Stones online, and you feel like fucking Indiana Jones because like you're you're putting the 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 groundwork, then you're going through the field work, then you're asking, and then you're finding the thing, you know, and it's just unbelievable. You're like sometimes sometimes these things like one of the stones up in Clonfad, the story was back in 1937 that said that a man Paddy Lang lifted 150 years ago, you know, so that's 150 years back from 1937. You're talking the late 1700s, you know where this man lifted a stone and it was remembered so well that the crossroads was named after him. It's called the Langan Crossroads because of that feat of strength. And then you, you get into this, I found this old abandoned fucking graveyard that like, it's not even on Google Maps, it's just a circle of trees. And like, I found this place and like, there was a stone just sitting there, you know, sitting there hundred years and no one picked it up, you know, and <laughs> you're like, I can't believe I found this thing, you know. You followed the clues, you you read the old folklore, and then you found it, you know. But like that one was amazing. But I mean, one that really stands out for me is the flag of Den up in County Cavan, because talking about supernatural and talking about folklore and mysticism, um, that stone has so much history attached to it. It 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 almost feels supernatural, you know. It has it used to be a cursing stone, you know, and you know about the cursing stones all around Ireland. Um 
there's so many of them. There's one just down the road from me here as well in, in, in Waterford that if you could turn these balloon stones or cursing stones that you could lay a curse or a blessing on on your neighbour or on someone who had done you wrong or right, you could either wish them well or curse them by moving a stone a certain way. And usually it was anti-clockwise if you wanted to curse them. But this stone was a large flagstone and the story goes that in, in Den Graveyard up in County Cavan, if you could flip this stone over because it was a very heavy stone, if you could flip it over, you could lay a curse um, onto your neighbours or whoever done you wrong. You usually have a curse on their, their livestock or their, their children. And you can know, and that's an incredible story. But this stone also was, uh, under penal law, it was a mass stone. So like it was where Catholic priests used to gather to say mass at the stone because of, you know, penal law, we couldn't say Catholic mass in Ireland. We had to say mass in graveyards or in hedges. So it was also like a, a mass rock. So it was a pagan cursing stone or a druidic cursing stone. Then it was a mass rock. And it was the lifting stone that the men used to lift at their funerals to see who was the strongest man in the parish or the strongest man in the day. And uh, I was like, I couldn't believe the stories about this thing. You know, and I could, I could talk about this stone all night because, I mean, there's, there's all of these supernatural stories attached to it as well. You know, there's stories about like headless horses drawing characters around the graveyard. There's meant to be a mermaid that lived in the lake beside the graveyard. You know, there's all of since the 1938, it was it was it was forgotten about. There's a new graveyard consecration. That one's forgotten about. So the weeds were fucking eight feet tall up there. So I literally had to hack my way through that graveyard to find this stone. It took me two and a half hours and I was just about to give up. And then I hit this fucking stone and it was like this huge flagstone with a carved cross on the top of it. And that was it. That was the flag of den. And I was like, I can't believe A, all of the stories about it. And B, they found it. It's it's there. You know, it, like this thing, like, uh, I, I've said it before, I think it should be in a museum. I, I don't know if should it be in a museum, but I think it should be a thing that people know about and people should go up and visit because this, like I said, it's, it's, it goes all the way back to our old druidic, you know, supernatural kind of uh, mythological kind of uh, point to it. You know, it's, it's just amazing. Uh, that, yeah, it's astonishing. And I, I it, it's... It's wonderful hearing you recount this because I've watched all your shit on YouTube, so I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, like uh, for those listening, and I'll put all the links to this in the show notes. But um, there's a, a fantastic videos of of um, of David finding these stones, hack, literally fucking hacking his way through the graveyard, <laughs> and, and then and then finding this thing, and it, and it's a, again another beast of a stone. It's huge. I mean, it's it has to be the heaviest little stone learned. They they had it down as five hundred weights in um, an old money. So like a hundred yeah. weight is fifty kilos, right? So you're talking five hundred weights is two hundred and fifty kilos, which is over five hundred pounds. You know, for for our American listeners, so it was like it's absolutely immense. It's about maybe three and a half foot tall by maybe three foot wide, about yeah. eight inches thick. It's just monstrous, but. I was so, so happy that I, I managed to pick that up the last time I was up there. Um, I had friends over, a guy came over from, from America, a guy called Sean Urquhart. And we went around, we'd done the first Irish stone lifting tour there about, about maybe uh, three months ago. And that was on the that was on the list. And we both got a lift of that um, up to knees, which back in the day warranted you getting into Duke. It warranted you becoming a local legend. You yeah. know, if yeah. you could pick that thing up to your knees, you were... Like I said, you gained a whole heap of social status for doing something like that. Yeah. You know? So it was, it was wonderful to continue that on, to be mm. the next link in the chain. Yeah. And for that stone, like literally to, to literally, metaphorically and physically fucking unearth that thing. Mm. You know, you pulled it out of the earth, but now you're continuing the story of it. It's it's wonderful, you know. I, it, it's remarkable. It really is, you know. And and like, from like a physical training perspective, like a um, point of view, like, what the fuck do you do to, to lift? <laughs> you know, I'm, not, I'm looking at this thing do? here, like, right, and it's yeah. like, I, you know, it's not fucking much smaller than Nissan Micra, you listen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, look, I, I'm lucky enough. I mean, I, I represent my country in, but it's not, a, I suppose it is a strength sport, it's a strength endurance sport. I, I, I done kettlebell sport for Ireland for maybe six, six to eight years I represented my country. So, I mean, it's, there was, there was a lot of posterior chain strength that I had yeah. Anyway, but it was more strength endurance. It wasn't brute strength. Like I'm not coming from a powerlifting or a strongman background. Right. So I mean, I had to put on a lot of weight that I'd lost <laughs> through um through this whole fitness, this whole strength endurance sport I was doing. 
I've had to put weight back on and, and lift heavier. But I mean, what I've been doing at the back is just lifting stone. You know, I have yeah. three stones at the back and I've been lifting them um, all the way through COVID and all the way through the last 12 months. You know, and it's amazing that once you just do something, mm-hmm. you know, three, four times a week, your body adapts. You know, I mean, I've gone from being just a big fat slob um, 12 years ago to running marathons, to yeah. competing and becoming world champion in a sport and kettlebell sport. And then on to this, you know, so it's like, if you do something enough, mm-hmm. your body will adapt to it, you know, so like, it, yeah. it's just amazing, you know. Fair play to you now, like, um, like, because I did, oh, what was it, about maybe five years ago, something like, I tend to give myself annual challenges, you know. Yes. And um, I did, a, I was going to do, I did a 5k every week. Mm. And, and what happened was I became a marginally f- faster fat man. <laughs> That's that's all. That, that's all that. I mean, it's better, you know. <laughs> you get better, you know. You do get better, but um, like for me, it's always been put a challenge ahead of me, and and I'll I'll, I'll go for it. You yeah. Know? So yeah. I mean, especially like I mean, the one that like the last one, I've, the big one I achieved was was lifting that Lima Flaherty song because the first time I, I I found it was eighteen months ago. Yeah. And I couldn't budge it off the ground. Couldn't pick it up millimeters. Just huge. And to then go lift it um, a couple of weeks ago in front of my my wife and, and and dad and and all of these other people was was amazing. You know, it was like amazing, like that. I, I'm not a young man; I'm 44, so like that, I could still yeah. get that much better in in a short space of time to do something like that. Just got to show you that you can. You know, I mean, yeah. I never let anyone tell you that you can't. You're too old or you're too unfit. You can do whatever the fuck you want as long as you're mind to it. You know? Yeah. No, 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 I totally get that now. Um, and there was a. There was a stone um, I wanted to ask you about because and there's people here listening that might think that this is like an entirely kind of like a a, a male orientated thing. I mean, it, it, it I mean, it brought, you know, it is to a degree. Some of these stones are, are fucking huge, you know, mm, you need mm. to be just big enough to be able to, to, to lift them. Um, I can't remember exactly where it was, but I know you had like a. Um, you had a clock on fire and there was a clock on van. Oh, yeah, that's incredible. I mean, that's that's wonderful. That's down in Faha Graveyard down in County Clare. That there's the clock na clock the man, which is the woman's stone, and clock the fair, which is the man's stone. So at funerals, and a lot of these stones, Dara, were lifted at funeral, um, funeral games. So again, back before maybe 150, maybe 200 years ago, there was funeral games held at, at large funerals. So like there was like car and elbow wrestling, horse racing, there was like um large stone lifting stone putting there was it was just it was a whole celebration of of life mm-hmm. that happened at these these funerals for for um well, well well regarded people but part of it like i said was stone lifting so like you had the man's lifting stone and the woman's lifting stone so i mean the men would lift the men's stone and see who could lift the highest yeah. and then they would get a whole heap of sort of social clout for that and then you had the woman's testing stone specifically for women that was a small little bit which were not a lot and the women on the day would pick Sika to pick that up. You know what I mean? So it was incredible that it wasn't just a man, a male dominated thing. It was yep. both men and women had a testing stone each, you know? And we went down there a couple of months ago with myself and, and Ireland's strongest woman, Aisha Ola, who be five times over Ireland's strongest woman, incredible, um, wow. incredibly strong woman. We went down together with a, a podcast crew and we lifted those stones together for the first time in, in modernity, you know? And, and to see her lift that woman's lifting stone was just beautiful. It was wonderful. It was like, I can't believe it. It's like, because I think, when was the last time people stood en masse and done this? Yeah. When was the last time a group of people met together in this cemetery to lift these stones? 100 years ago? 150 years ago? Maybe more, you know? And now you've literally brought that back from the dead, you know? And the fact that you're in a graveyard wasn't lost on me. You could feel the weight at the moment, you know, mm-hmm. metaphorically and physically. And, um, but just to see K um Aisha do that was 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 wonderful, you know. And I've been talking to this the landowner since a man called Cyril Conlon, an absolutely wonderful man, um, who is the landowner that those stones are on. And he said, David, 13 people came to lift that stone last week alone. He said. Did 13 they? 13 people last week came to lift the stone. So he said, not only is the fucking tradition after coming back, he said it's back yeah. with a vengeance. You know, so I said, so Cyril, I said, I hope you don't mind. I love what he said. I think it's fantastic. He just says people calling up to him. Like 13 in a week, that's like two a day. You know, it's two people. And he said, it's people from all over the world have come. He said, I've had guys here from Texas. I've had a guy come from Germany. They've seen you online. They've seen what you're doing. And they want to be a part of it. You know, amazing, brilliant. There it's back. It's yeah. now actually back. It's not just me doing it. It's now mm-hmm. people are getting wind of it. It's like, fuck, 
I want to go do that. That sounds amazing. Mm-hmm. And you have people come from, you know, from all over the world to do it as well. So how, how wonderful is that? Uh, that's it is truly, truly wonderful. It really is. Um, it's special. Uh, it's very yeah. like a saying. Like the, it's. I I think there's a huge amount of ancestral healing happen with that. You know, I mean, like from like from my perspective and probably the perspective of a lot of people who listen to this this podcast would 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 imagine like that the spirits of place would be absolutely alive when this is happening. I hope so. I mean, I, I hope so. But like, because I mean, I went to one there that I haven't talked about it, uh, to anybody. I went to a place called Alnacali up in um, County Galway. It's it was an old famine village, and that was abandoned. Uh, the last person to leave it left in the nineteen forties, so it was t- it's totally abandoned. Like there's no one lived there in almost a hundred years. I heard about it, it was an old story. Um, the man called Tim Robinson was interviewing people back in the forties, and he this last person living in the village told him about the lifting stone of this village, and. It's been obviously been sitting there for, for over 100 years, maybe more than no one had lifted it. So I got wind of this story. Someone sent it to me online. And then I got in contact with my friend up in, up in uh, Shona Costalva. And he was like, oh, I know where that is. He said, I have a vague idea where it is. Call up to me and have a look. And we'll ask a few locals. So we, we got up. I drove up to Galway. I was up there in all of it. And I think nine o'clock in the morning. I was just so excited to walk and see, could I find this place? And we drove down this wicked overgrown old road. And then we were jumping ditches and hedges and walls. And we got to this old abandoned village, like just this full village of houses, old corrocks rotted on the side of the, wow. the estuary. Um, there was an old boat that we pulled up, old fiberglass boat that was like almost like f- f- falling apart. And there was all these old houses, hand-built stone houses, stone lintels, like hand-built with stone, you know, dry stone. Like, this place is fucking unbelievable. But no one had lived here in 100 years and no one had visited it, I say, in 100 years. You know, yeah. it's so off the beaten track. But you could feel a tangible presence there. You know, mm-hmm. you could feel a tangible presence there. So Sean and I were walking. I said, how do we know which stone? And Sean immediately said, that's it. That's it there, he said. And I looked at him. I was like, yeah, he said, that's an anchor stone. He said that the men used to anchor their boats on that stone. You can see the rope mark in it. And he sees a rope mark in this stone. Yeah. He said, that's the anchor stone in the village. I said, people used to lift that stone up. I said, I can guarantee it's that one. And the minute I looked at it, I was like, no, that has to be it. Because there was mooring stones around. There was this ancient stone jetty. And right beside the stone jetty was this anchor stone. Because in the story, he said, it was the, the very, very first house that they went to after they came in from collecting seaweed or from fishing. They used to meet at the meeting house. And in front of the meeting house was the stone. And this stone was in front of the very, very first meeting house. So, but I picked that stone up and... Like I said, when was the last time someone was strong enough to lift that stone up in this famine village? You're thinking back 150 years, mm-hmm. you know, more. Yeah. And it was a beautiful moment because Sean was there like, and he was saying poetry in Irish and he was asking the stone, was it, you know, it's permission to lift it. And he was asking the spirits of the place our permission to be there and to lift it, you know. And like I said, I don't talk about this kind of stuff a lot, but I, I could feel something there, you know. I could feel something there. And to lift the stone then, you, I, I got this sense of elation from it that I can't describe, you know. Um, it was, yeah, it was it was unique, you know. And to, to you, you feel like you're carrying on the tradition of a dead place. I mean, the place is dead. The people are dead. It's that the village was gone, but now you've done something that would bring people back to this village, mm-hmm. you know, hopefully and um, respectfully. And it was, yeah, it was, it was a very, very special moment. Um, I just wanted to share that with you. Well, thank you. I really, I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, David, it's it's been truly, truly brilliant chatting to you. You know, uh, oh, thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed the chat. I had a good chat to you all night, obviously, you know, because we're fucking chatting. <laughs> <laughs> we just saw the time. But uh, yeah, man, we got to meet up and have a fucking a face to face some stage. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I'm going to get my fat ass down the gym now and um, try and fucking. <laughs> Next time you're over, <laughs> next time you're sitting around this, you're in England at the moment. Next time you're over, yeah, give me a shout. I mean, yeah, no, that, that'd be deadly. Like. That'd be brilliant. Yeah. And and come here to me now. If if, if anybody wants to find out the best place to, to, to follow you and, and or understand and learn a bit more about your 
your adventures? Where's the best place for them to do so? I think the best place will be on Instagram. I'm on there. So I'm down as Indiana Stones on that. So just type in Indiana Stones, see a picture of me holding a massive fucking pink boat in front of me. You can't miss it. <laughs> and um, just hit me up on that and a private message. You know, I mean, anyone wants to have a chat, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm more than willing yeah. to have a chat about this kind of things. And if anybody has any information, even better, please let me know. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's been really enjoyable chatting to you. And, oh my God, is the, I think I'm, I'm looking because I've got your YouTube up here now. And um, yeah, is that the anchor stone, the one with the hole in the middle you're, you're pulling up? No, that's the actual, um, that's the one over in Inish Baffin. That's the Clucknor okay. rating. That's the uh, the ancient Ballon stone. So that, like, oh, okay. that okay. Yeah, that's right, an old, right. that was an old Ballon, that, um, an, old, an old Druidic offering bowl. And now it's, they live to us, they get to lift the Druidic yeah. offering bowl onto the Roman Catholic altar in an old <laughs> ancient monastery looking at Crow Patrick. I mean, like, it doesn't get any more higher than that, you know? That's fucking huge. It's massive. It's about 180 kilos. And it's like I a big donut. Just, so you know, they, they, they yeah. grab it in the middle and try and... I mean, it's like, it's like a room. tractor tire. That's fucking that's it, yeah, made out of stone. Yeah. Amazing stuff. Um, it's been a genuinely, genuine pleasure to 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 chat to you, David. And, and thank I, you so I, much, Darren. I, I, really I, appreciate I, it, man. And I know I speak for, for so many people when I say, you know, thank you for what you're doing. Like, uh, not only is it wonderful to have you on the show and having a, a great chat, but, you know, as, a, as, as an Irish person, you know, thank you for what you're doing. You're doing a very special thing. I really appreciate that and I'm going to keep going thank you so much Dad it's long before long before wonderful 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 stuff i really really enjoyed that that was a tremendous conversation hugely inspiring conversation and um i think i'm going to have to go down to the gym properly now and stop dicking about because i i can't tell you if i could lift one of those stones the enormous sense of pride um and almost kind of sacredness i can you get that you get the waves of that coming off david like the sacredness that he's experiencing through doing this you know uh it's deeply deeply i have a huge admiration for him and it's deeply deeply moving and it's something i'd like to experience myself so there's only one way to do that <laughs> right that's enough for me i'm Dara mason and you've been listening to spirit box take care talk soon bye